Yeah, so sorry for the quick review, but just wanted to get your calculus gears rolling. If you see a sum of things or a difference of things, to take its derivatives, you take derivatives of each individual piece and then just add or subtract them back together. Not me, right? So we've got x cubed that we can take the derivative of using the power rule. We've got negative 2x, which we can also take the derivative of using the power rule. Now I guess we can take the derivative of this using the power rule, but it's a constant. So we'll just remember that that's 0. So this just gives us 3x squared minus 2x to the 0 and x to the 0 is equal to 1 for all x not equal to 0. We'll remember that. And plus 0. So that's the derivative. For this one, we actually have to do a little more work. We have to utilize the product rule, which means take the derivative of the first guy, Multiply it by the second, then multiply the first by the derivative of the second, derivative of e to the x is the easiest one you'll ever do, just e to the x. For this one we have to use the power rule, we can multiply by the power and subtract one from the power. Just x to the first one. So if you got these two results, you're good. You did great. You could have simplified, perhaps, maybe factor out an x or an e to the x if you wanted to, but that's beyond the call. Quick, good review of what we did last time <coughs> with the product rule and e to the x. Questions about this stuff? Yes, please ask. Uh, where'd the x squared look if you turn the x out of this stuff? Oh, uh, you know what? It came from this. I was thinking ahead what it was going to be and probably wrote the two. The power rule states you multiply by the power and reduce the power by one. By one. Now I'm, now I'm paranoid. By one. Yes. So the x squared comes from correctly reducing it by one. There's this common phrase, make sure your brain is engaged before putting your mouth into gear, something like that. Yeah, sorry, I had that problem just a minute ago. Other questions? Yes? Um, see, now I'm paranoid. I'm doing things incorrectly, left and right. So two things wrong with me today. I was not intending to do those incorrectly, but you all are very gracious and kind. I appreciate that. <laughs> it should be two. Well, I'm not sweating yet. Maybe I will be by the end of the lecture. We'll see. Other questions? You know, as you work through the homework, uh, there's just a lot of these questions like this. Um, they don't necessarily take very long if you know which rules to apply and, and how to apply those rules. So we're going to go through um, just briefly the conclusion of section 3.2, which was on the product and the quotient rules. Then we'll get into section 3.3. I'm going to give you some options today for what you want to see. Um, I suggest I know the answer ahead of time, but I might not. So, review product rule. Let's say you've got two functions multiplied together. And 
and you want it to take their derivative. Last time we worked through in general what that looks like, and it turns out it's the derivative of the first times the second unchanged. It's just the original function g added to the original function f unchanged. No derivative of it yet. That happened here. Times the derivative of the second. This is the product rule. A natural question is then what is the derivative of its inverse operation with two functions. Products have as inverses quotients. To undo the effect of a multiplication, you divide. So what is the derivative of a quotient <coughs> of functions? In other words, f divided by g derivative so similar very similar but it's a little bit different than the product rule There it is. It is, like I said, very similar with a key change in the middle. Because again, we can think of we can think of quotients as multiplication. F times 1 over G. So it, it doesn't maybe it shouldn't surprise us that there's similarity here. Right? And if we remember taking derivatives of fractions, 1 over x, 1 over x plus 1, remember there's a negative sign that pops out because the power is negative 1. Right? So when taking the derivative of something like 1 over g, it makes sense that there's a negative sign there. But there's maybe a big mystery about where this g of x squared comes from. Do you remember what you took the derivative of this, what you got? It's negative 1 over x squared. I think we've done this exact one before. So this maybe doesn't surprise us. So, Here's your choice today, first of maybe many. This is the rule for quotients. Take the derivative of the first times the second, minus the first times the derivative of the second. The second is always this one down here. And then you divide by the bottom squared. <clears throat> and I've given you sort of an ad hoc, sort of, it's kind of like this explanation, your choice that you can make right now is, do you want to see the proof of all this like we did last time with the product rule? It occupied probably 20 minutes of lecture last time. If you want to see it, that's fine. If there's sufficient numbers of you, I can give that. If not, we can just move on. And we'll move right on to using this thing. This is kind of like you know your parents asking you a long time ago, or yesterday, I don't know. I don't know you necessarily. You know, they give you the keys to the car and they say, "Do you want to drive or do you want to learn how the car is built?" So, do you want to learn to drive or do you want to see how the car was built? Here's the keys. Proof. <laughs> Audibly, no. The only time I can get something out of some of you, I ask, "Do you want to see the proof?" No. Okay. All right. That's fine. That's fine. I'm not offended. Uh, somehow I'm in chapter 5 of this book. We're not there yet. So that's fine. 
3, 1. We're just going to use it. We're going to practice with it. What's a common kind of quotient function or a common kind of ratio, not to give it away, function that you know about? There's types of functions we've talked about, polynomials, exponentials, logarithms, trig functions. There's one of them that is literally built like this. Ratio null functions, rational functions. Take one polynomial, divide by another, right? So let's say, I'm not going to use the letter F here, I'll use something else. Let's say H of X is equal to some polynomial divided by some other polynomial. Do they factor? I don't think so. Can we cancel terms out? I, I don't think so. But we can view this like a ratio of two functions. So we'll let f of x equal the top, and we'll let g of x equal the bottom. The reason I'm saying that is because this rule is written in terms of a function f divided by a function g. And if I say this is f and this is g, then we have f of x over g of x, don't we? Which is f over g of x. So we're just setting the stage for the, an application of this. So this rule, do I need to wait? Are we catching up writing? this rule, we just need to sort of fill in the blanks. h prime of x is the derivative of the top times the bottom function minus the bottom function with its derivative times the original function, the first top one, all divided by the bottom function, squared. So let's piece it together. What's the derivative of x squared minus 4? Well, this is a polynomial. It's a difference of them, so I can take the derivatives of each piece and then just take the difference of them. And if my maths are correct, as they've not been so far today, to take the derivative of x squared, it's multiply by the 2, subtract 1 from the exponent. To take the derivative of negative 4, I remember that's a constant, and derivatives of constants are 0. So this is f prime. I'll just label it. Then we multiply by the original denominator function, g, which is x cubed minus x plus 1. I'll label that. Really tiny g of x. Continuing this puzzle, doesn't matter which order, 
I put G prime first. Um, you can put F first if you want, like I wrote here. It doesn't really matter because multiplication is commuted, right? So um, we'll put G time just because that's what I have here. Three X to the three minus one minus one X to the one minus one plus zero because that's a constant, the so one is constant. Times f of x, x squared minus four. All divided by g of x squared. So from here, it's all algebraic arithmetic. Simplifying it down. But as it stands, that's the derivative. This is 2x. <coughs> so multiplying through gives us 2x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 2x. That's this product. Minus, this is 3x squared. 3x squared times x squared is 3x to the fourth. 3x squared times minus 4 is minus 12x squared. Minus 1, right? This is x to the 0, so this is just minus 1. So minus 1 times x squared is minus x squared. Minus 1 times negative 4 is plus 4. All divided by x cubed minus x plus 1 squared. Combining like terms, I've got x to the fourths here. I've got x squared here. And there's a constant term and just a linear term. From here, you know what I mean? It's just this process of boiling it down to what the simplified result is. But again, we've already done the differentiation. So are there questions about the derivative taking? If not, we're going to go just do more examples. Yes? Can we just leave it as that number? We don't know. Like I said, you can keep going, but that's not calculus. Here's the calculus. Yeah. So. minus 3 is negative x before negative 2x plus 12x squared plus another x squared that's plus 13x squared that gives us 11x squared 2x minus 4 and then divided by that you can multiply out the denominator if you want but yeah you get it to this point and that's pretty simple leave it there on quizzes and tests, honestly, you get it to this point, and that's pretty much most of the credit. Yeah. A couple points maybe left over for the simplification, but only if simplification was asked for. Other questions about it? Okay, yeah, this is this is kind of a fantastic result. Uh, right before class, I was helping a student in office hours, and um, you know, I said we're coming up with this long list of just kind of tools, these, this long list of like patterns that we see from limits. And now we don't need to go back to the limits definition all the time. We can kind of just apply the rules, right? So this is one of those patterns that is not simple. 
it's kind of a big jigsaw puzzle to put together and then to boil down in the end. But this is another one of those nice patterns that's seen. This one's called the quotient rule. You see this phrase, quotient rule. That's what it's referring to. Let's do more examples. Can I erase this one? Yep, okay. The hardest part about these is just identifying what functions are what. What's my function f and what's my function g? Here is one. If there's no power on a variable, it's one. So you multiply by the power, you reduce the power by one. And we recall that any number in the zero is one except zero. This is one most of the time. <laughs> Unless somebody's being really good. Have everything that you need now. What's the derivative of h of x? It's f prime times g minus f times g prime divided by g. Shouldn't the E's cancel out because one's a negative and one's a positive? Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't put a task me to miss something like that right now. E to the X times X minus E to the X minus E to the X. How many e to the x's do we have there? Mm -hmm. We have a negative 1 e to the x and another negative 1 e to the x. Mm -hmm. Minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2. So we get e to the x times x minus 2 e to the x. Mm -hmm. yes. Great question. I did not go through all of this. I factored out the e to the x because there's a common factor in both left over here is x minus 1. What's left over here is 1. We can drop the parentheses because there's no negative sign <coughs> here. x minus 1 minus 1 is minus x minus 2. Okay, I'm kind 
confident I got it. Like I said, sometimes it's difficult to figure out what your functions are. So let me just give you a cheeky example. This is your function h of x. Can you tell me what h prime of x is off the top of your head? No writing anything down, just looking up for it. Yes, Nikai. It's right there. What's f of x? Okay, you can choose one if you want. There's an easier thing to choose. How about e to the x? Remember this rule with exponentials and powers? If you've got a negative power in the denominator, you can bring it to the top and negate its power. This is no different than e to the positive x over x minus 1. Just by definition of powers and powers and variables. So that's this derivative. This. So I said it was a cheeky example, but I intended it for to fool you just a little bit. Let's do another one. constant is? Derivative of x squared is? Derivative of 1 is? We have our derivatives. So now we piece it together. Derivative of f, the top, times the bottom, minus f times the derivative of the bottom divided by the bottom squared. And this is just, that's zero. This is minus 2x over x squared plus 1 squared. Done. Dare give you an example with a product rule inside a quotient rule? I dare. There's my real estate. I need to erase it. <laughs> you done writing? Yes, Tristan, you good? There's smoke coming up from your paper. You're writing so fast. Yeah, like the, this, the difficulty of these things just compounds with what you've got. What we've got up top is a product of functions. I could put a product down here too if I was really, really feeling honorary. the 
derivative of each piece. the easy one. Okay, you do the hard one. derivative of this times this plus the derivative of this times this. Product rule, I erased it, f times g is the derivative of the first times the second plus first times the derivative of the second. e to the x, sorry, I swapped like the ordering. Derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x times e to the x. Plus the derivative of e to the x, which is e to the x, times x squared plus 1. Yes. Right, things just get messier and messier, the more of these things we embed into each other. So what is the derivative of a prime of x? I'm not going to actually simplify this down, but we'll fill in the pieces. Derivative of f, 2x e to the x plus e to the x times x squared plus 1. This is f prime of x times g of x minus f of x times g prime of x. all divided by g of x squared. I'm not simplifying that. You can do that. Yes? If we were on, like, if this was on the test, would, can we leave it like that? If yeah, in that some way? cases I will tell you. Do it. Do the calculus and don't touch it. This is where then the errors really start compounding. Right. Other questions? Quotient rules okay? Okay. You still don't want to know how it works? Do you think we should know how it works? Someday. That's fine. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine, people. It's fine. Okay? You know, you don't need to know how it works. But you do know how it works. Right? Because you know how to start. Limit as h goes to nothing of f over g of x plus h minus f over g of x, all divided by h. And go from there. You could literally start writing down a table and work it out. You could from there. And then you would see this pattern. Or you could use some algebraic manipulations and some tricks of the trade to simplify it down into finding out, hey, that's just derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all divided by the bottom squared. It's just algebra after you write down the limit, which you all know. Right? Yeah. Okay, here we go. I think you do. I think you got it. That's it for 3.2. Product and quotient rules.
It can't get any harder than this. Right? Right. Right. Conceptual check. Pulse check, we'll ask. Tell your neighbor what a derivative tells you. What a derivative tells you. Just tell your neighbor. If I give you a function, what's its derivative tell you? Tell you? Slope. <coughs> the original function. Here's another question. What if the original function told you slope? It tells you the slope of that slope. Holy smokes. What's the slope of x squared? What's the slope of 2x? That's a line, so it's 2. Oh, it's positive. What's the shape of this look like? It looks like this. We'll get there. We'll get there. There's something there. Something that's cool, perhaps. Okay, well, that's not where we're at, unfortunately. Where we're at... It's right here. We had to get here at some point. We've been putting it off for a long time. We sort of played in the shallow end for a while with polynomials, and then we definitely played in the shallow end you know, as we were coming out of the pool, taking derivatives of e to the x, which of course is just e to the x. We all know this day was coming. Trade derivatives. Uh, this stuff gives graduate students difficulties, so if you're in that boat, that's okay. But we're going to think about these things from like a conceptual perspective, and I can give you the answers. And if we want them worked out, I can work them out for you. Some of you do work out, I'm sure. But maybe I can take you to the point in some of these where the hard part is staring at us, and we just say, we'll stop, and we'll go to the answer. Trig derivatives. Derivatives tell us slope, right? Let's construct the derivative of sine. Some, some key points of it, at least. Sine of x is a wave starting at 0, 0, and oscillates back and forth. Right? This is sine of x. Do I dare graph the derivative of it on this? Is that okay? Okay. So I'm going to graph the derivative of sine in blue. We're going to look at some points on this curve where the derivative is pretty simple. And we're just going to sort of fill in the gaps in between. We sort of trace our hands along this, and we're reading the slope of the edge of our hand. There are some spots where the slope is pretty well understood, I hope. It's at the tops and at the bottoms of these waves. What are the slopes at the tops and bottoms? If I drew a tangent line, remember, at these 
points. What are the slopes of those? Zero. They're flat. So if I were to graph for this point, which corresponds to an angle of 90 degrees, or pi over 2, the derivative of sine has a value of <coughs> 0. At this point, which corresponds to an angle of 3 pi over 2, the derivative has a value of 0. At this point, which is 2 pi plus pi over 2, 0. At this point, which corresponds to 4 pi minus pi over 2, the slope is 0. I mean, we're, we're most of the way there to construct the graph of our derivative. We kind of just need one more point in between every interval, and I suggest we have it. Right in between these maxes and mins, we just pick this point and consider what the slope of that is. Here, I'll tell you, because this is the difficult part then we're going we're gonna to see something coming out really nice, actually. Here it's negative, here it's positive, here it's negative, here it's positive. It oscillates back and forth. That might sound like what the original function is doing anyway, or a related function. And I'll just tell you, the slope here is negative 1. It's exactly negative 1. Here it's exactly positive 1. My graph doesn't do it justice, but if we were to measure the slope exactly halfway between these two, the slope is exactly negative 1. If we measure the slope exactly halfway between these two points, the slope would be perfectly 1. So in the construction of our derivative, at each of these points, we're going to place a value. And I'll clean up as I go. Here it would be positive 1, right? Here, negative 1. Here, positive 1. Here, negative 1. Here, positive 1. And now I'm just going to fill in the blanks. This is, you're just going to have to trust me on this, that I filled in the blanks approximately correctly. So now you tell me, what's the derivative function of sine? What is this graph a graph of? Many of you know. This is great. What is it? Cosine. Cosine. same process now with this curve. I could do it in green, but I'm not that good at graphing. Maybe now's the time to practice. Slope of zero. 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 Negative one slope here. Positive one slope here. Negative one slope here. Positive one slope here. Connect the dots as gently as you can. That's exactly the opposite. The negative of the black curve. We're just listing all sorts of trig derivatives right now. Whoa. Okay. 
we're at that point I mentioned earlier. You ready to work out the difficult parts or do you want to just continue along? We see these worked out rigorously, perhaps. We'll do one after I go to this. I'm not going to graph it. I'm not that old. Or misguided. Do you know of anything that can help us with this? Oh, we do know something. We are. What kind of quotient is tangent besides mean? Sine over cosine, by definition. I see a quotient of functions, don't you? Fill in the blanks and simplify. It. Let's see where this see where this road takes us. Derivative of a quotient is derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. divided by the bottom squared. A golden ticket for the person who simplifies that first. <laughs> and can tell me the theorem they used. The particular name of it. This golden ticket doesn't take you to a chocolate factor. Sorry. That's sine squared of x on the right, up on top, plus sine squared of x, yeah. Okay, well, I'll take us all one step closer then. Minus, minus sine, we've got multiplication, these cancel. So this is sine squared. What's this? Yes? Golden ticket. What's this top equal to? One. That's the Pythagorean theorem for trig functions. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one. Pythagorean theorem, right? One over cosine squared is the same as one over cosine squared. That's secant. Yes. I got it all the way until you did the one over cosine squared. Right. This is one squared divided by cosine squared. When you've got a ratio of two functions to the same power, you can write it as the ratio to that power. One and cosine are both squared, so we can take that ratio one over cosine and then raise the whole ratio. How'd you get one again? Because it's cosine to sine? Yes. Sidebar. If you have any point on the unit circle, there's a triangle that exists from the origin over a bit and then up to that point. This is a right triangle. The coordinates at this point are cosine of the angle comma sine of the angle. This length is the x coordinate. This length is the y coordinate. And you know the Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So cosine squared plus sine squared equals this hypotenuse squared. On a unit circle, what's the radius? That equals 1.
Wouldn't it be great? Sine's derivative is cosine. Cosine's derivative is negative sine. If you take the derivative of negative sine, what do you get? Negative cosine. If you take the derivative of negative cosine, you get sine. It wraps back around after you take a few derivatives. Wouldn't it be great? Derivative of tangent is secant squared. What's the derivative of secant squared? Wouldn't it be great? Negative tangent. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's too easy. Too easy. What is it though? Can I erase? Okay. I claim you know how to find the derivative of secant. And secant squared. Secant is 1 over cosine. That's a ratio of functions. To take its derivative, we take and use the rule for taking derivatives of ratios of functions. f of x is the nice, simple case of 1. g of x is cosine of x. f prime of x, 0, obviously. g prime of x, negative sine of x. This all just builds on itself, doesn't it? This just keeps going. <sighs> Secant of x, according to the quotient rule, its derivative is derivative of the top times the bottom. Zero times cosine is zero, so I'm just going to write it zero. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. All divided by the bottom squared. Just sort of simplifying here, negative signs cancel. One times sine is just sine. This is sine of x over cosine squared of x. I'm going to write that a little differently. Is that okay? Cosine squared is cosine times cosine. If I multiply these two fractions together, I get 1 times sine on top and cosine times cosine on bottom. So this is the same. What's this? As a function, you know. Times? Fortunately, to find the derivative of secant squared, we need to take two of these, multiply together, then differentiate. Oh boy. Sounds like product rule. secant squared of x is equal to the derivative of secant of x times secant of x. That is, the derivative of secant of x times secant of x plus secant of x times the derivative of secant of x, just the product rule. So it's two of these guys, because they're the same, right? We just found secant of x, the derivative of it, right? Tangent secant of x. 2 tangent of x secant of x. That's the derivative times secant of x.
tangent times secant squared. Can we simplify that at all? Maybe. But long story short, it does not wrap back around. Sine and cosine kind of alternate back and forth when you take derivatives. It's apparent from their graphs. Tangent has no such relationship. Take its derivative, you get secant squared. Take the derivative of that, you do not get back tangent. Not even negative tangent. It's ta two tangent of secant squared of x. Wow, we went through quite a few. Derivatives. I remember sitting in your chairs a long time ago, working these out for the first time, just making a long table of trig derivatives. And I've taken you through some of them. Oh, we didn't even. Yeah, we didn't even do that. Oh. Taking you through some of them. I haven't even hit most of them. Which trig functions am I forgetting? Cosecant and cotangent. Okay, we've got secant. We don't have cosecant. We don't have cotangent. <laughs> we've got 15 minutes left. Yeah, let's do them, right? Okay. What would you say? Is there a motif for today? Is there a repeating theme of something that's really useful in computing these? Quotient rule. Yes. Quotient rule. Quotient rule. Quotient rule. You just be chanting that on your way out of class, I think. That's on the board. That's on the board. Go for it. <laughs> okay. I will go for it. Here we go. If you want to, in your notes, work on these your own without listening. I will not judge you. If you need or want me to work it through with you, I will not judge you. Here we go. Cotangent. How can we rewrite that as a fraction? 1 over tangent, I like that. So our top function is 1, derivative of 1 is nothing, that simplifies the quotient rule quite a lot. Bottom function is tangent, derivative of a tangent is secant squared. Let's put it together. Derivative of the top times tangent. So not minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. Uh, yeah, bottom. Divided by the bottom squared. Negative secant squared of x divided by tangent squared of x. This is where the simplification becomes a little bit hairy. Secant squared is a, is a nice relationship to tangent squared, do you remember? It's a long time ago. Okay. Let's take the Pythagorean the theorem. Let's divide everything by, well, I don't know, what is secant? Secant is 1 over cosine, right? Let's divide everything by cosine squared. That gives us 1 plus tangent squared of x equals secant squared of x. If 
That fraction simplifies quite a bit. Negative here, so we're going to put that back in the end. For now, let's concern ourselves with simplifying. 1 over tangent squared is the same as cotangent squared. Tangent squared over tangent squared is 1. Negative sign. What is that? We could rewrite this actually, maybe in terms of something a little bit simpler. Let's take our original. Pythagorean theorem, and instead of dividing everything by cosine squared, let's divide everything by sine squared. Cosine squared over sine squared is cotangent squared. Sine squared over sine squared is 1. If I throw a negative sign in front of this, that's exactly what I have here, which means I just need to throw a negative sign over here, and I can tell you exactly what this is. Negative 1 over sine squared. Negative 1 over cosecant squared. There's a really nice parallel here. Tangent's derivative is secant squared. Cotangents is cosecant squared with a negative. This parallels exactly what's going on with the sines and cosines being on top and bottom of the original function. Negative signs pop out from these guys, depending on which one you're differentiating. That's where that negative sign comes from. And this relationship between tangent and secant squared and cotangent and cosecant also is reflected in that fact. What's dividing what? The negative sign and cosecant come out because you're dividing in the opposite order from tangent. There's a huge interplay between all the trig functions, as we've seen. Uh, and it, it, it's just it's a nice thing to be aware of. Questions? I've been going like the speed of light. Questions? This is all good? It's like a thousand examples of quotient rules today. Did any of you work out the derivative of cosecant yet? Uh, negative cotangent times cosecant. That seems like it's on the right track to all of us, right? Derivative of secant, tangent times secant. Derivative of cosecant might have the same shape, a tangent times a secant type thing. The negative sign might just pop out because cosecant is 1 over sine, and there's that negative sign from the quotient rule which survives. Exactly the same structure that I've been doing every single time, right? I identify the top functions, identify the bottom, differentiate the top, differentiate the bottom, just plug it into the formula. That prime times who cares? It's zero. Minus f times g prime. divided by g squared and do a little bit of algebra
Questions? Okay. Yeah. Do you? There's like these little tricks of the physics trade where you make close approximations and then you say this like, oh, it won't matter in the end, sort of thing. And it work, things work out really nicely. For example, pendulums. You compute their oscillation frequency by making one of these nice little approximations. Do you remember studying pendulums? <laughs> the period is directly related to the length of the pendulum. A pendulum is a thing that you fix somewhere, it's suspended, it swings back and forth. The length of this tells you the period, basically. How long it takes it to go back and forth, or how many times a second it goes back and forth, in, in hertz, right? But this solution of this kind of predicated on this angle. Is small. Why is that the case? Why is that needed? It's this. Do you all know why calculus was, quote, invented or discovered? What was it discovered or invented for? Physics. Physics. When the angle is small, what's the angle approximately? When the angle is small, think about the unit circle. Think about what a degree or a radian r, and think about this. That arc length we call a radian measure, right? That's literally the angle t in radians. What is sine of t? Sine of t is, in this right triangle, the height of that triangle. When you have a really small angle, what's the relationship between these two guys? Take a right triangle that's ridiculously thin. There's a circle that comes around here, and it gets, you know, it's got a little curvature there. What's the difference between this arc length here from this point around and this height? They're basically the same. If you take a thin enough angle, the curve of the circle is almost negligible compared to the vertical leg of the triangle. Practically the same, off by very little now. What's this limit? When t gets basically zero, when it's practically nothing. What's the difference between the curve of the circle and the vertical part of the triangle? Basically nothing. What does this ratio become? One. Clear? No? If, it, if not, this was the thing that I was talking about earlier. I said, well, just when taking these derivatives of functions, trig functions, well, maybe I'll ask you later if you want to see the 
gory details. Here's one of them that we didn't ever think about. Oh, great question. Well, fortunately, you know how to take this. How do you take this? You make a table, and you find the ratio. Sorry. Quick reminder, quiz Friday on only 3.1. Only 3.1. Homework is due for 3.1 tomorrow still. 3.2 is due next week, Thursday. It says it's still due tomorrow. I must have gotten that down. I don't think so. I said 14. When I was looking at it yesterday, it was like both of them are due. I was extremely lost.